by the way, I don't regret the opportunity. The opportunity to sign to an artist of that magnitude, that's that smart and all these different things is a golden opportunity. The choice was either to do that or nothing. I'm doing that every time. In 2005, a 16-year-old from Detroit with dreams of rap superstardom had an idea. After learning that Kanye West would be at his local radio station, Sean Anderson talked his way into the studio to perform an impromptu audition and was promptly signed to Kanye West's Good Music imprint. Over the next two decades, Big Sean would become one of music's biggest stars, but he would have to overcome music industry politics as well as his own demons to truly realize his dreams. And it all started with one idea. Tell me a little bit about the power of yes. The power of yes. To me, the power of yes is, is welcoming. It's like inviting it all, you know what I mean? And that's also a song on an album that it's like, I got so many different versions, you know? I got like versions with Yachty on it. I got, vers I got like a lot of versions of that song where the production is different. It's just like, it's a super fun song to me. And even though it's very lighthearted and very like just turned up, it's like it has an energy and a mindset to it though. You know, it has that essence over it of like, like you said, the power of yes. I know that your parents were incredibly instrumental in framing many parts of your personality in your life. And you've talked about your dad um, and how he dressed and you know, <laughs> obviously your mom, you know, and the way that she reared you. But I'm curious, how did, their professional lives inform your ambition? Man, I think they influenced me because I saw them work their ass off and be not have any money still. And it was frustrating seeing my mom cry over bills, you know, it was frustrating being in debt. It taught me early on that it's not about how hard you work because they would bust their ass. My mom would have two jobs, you know, she was an English teacher, social studies teacher. And then she also did like after school tutoring and it was like, wiped out every day, like so tired. And my dad was a manager at the airlines and then had another, when, we, when he got remarried, they had another business. And it was just like, they were constantly working. And I realized it's not about how hard you work. It's about how smart you work. My mom was an actress in her own right. You know, she lived in New York for 10 years with my dad and then moved to LA to try and be an actress out here. But her dream never fully got fulfilled all the way when it was, my time for it to happen for me, she was more than supportive. I think that's why my mom supported me so hard from the jump, because she saw that creativity, that spark, and she just did everything she could to pour gasoline on it. My biggest early supporter was my mom, for sure. She was the first person I rapped for. She was just super encouraging, cheering me on, and like, yo, you're pretty good, like, keep it going. Fast forward, when I was in high school, right? My mom was already in debt and she would be running up her credit cards more and more for me to record my music, you know, and print up. I shot my first album cover at Sears and, you know, selling the CDs around. So I just appreciate her for seeing it all the way through. And she showed up my whole life. Given the fact that they were really humping it out with nine to fives, uh -huh. and you come from Detroit, where not a lot of rap talent has co had come from, particularly then. Now it's a little bit different, right. thanks in part to you. How did you sort of even contemplate the idea of being a creative and like really seize on the idea that you could be a professional entertainer, given, you know, the sort of lack of representation of people around you that were doing that? Well, I mean, it was such a like impossible idea. It doesn't seem impossible now. It seems like almost like expected, but back then from Detroit, it just was like, 
you better off lying saying you from New York or something, or you better off saying you from somewhere else because it just wasn't happening. I got super shut down from just like every angle. When I would go to school and be selling CDs, I would get shut down immediately. Teachers telling me that, you know, like, yo, what, like, why are you doing this? Like, come on, like, you got, you, you a smart student. Like, you get a scholarship, man. You don't waste your time on this music stuff, man. But now I go back to my school. They got a recording studio, a Big <laughs> Sean studio in the school. You know, I'm, been, I'm building all these studios at the boys and girls clubs in Detroit, like, because there's so much talent there. And then you look at Babyface Ray, V's, Peasy, Icewear Vezo, Cash Doll, um, Skilla Baby, and so on and so forth. It's like a long list I'm not naming. It's so, such a wave now, but it was not a wave when I first started. Everyone else in my family was kind of like, eh, but my mom was the one like, yo, just keep going, like, you got it. Like, just see it, you know, just visualize it. And it, uh, it, it ended up working out. You mentioned that counselor, you know, asking you, why are you doing this? Uh -huh. What was animating you to make music? Like, what was the feedback? What was the feeling that you were getting that inspired you to keep going and to want and to wanna express yourself in that way? I guess just intuition, really. I guess just like, I just saw it. I just felt it, you know? I don't know, it's like, can't explain it. I remember I used to ride to school with my boy Tone and just be like, man, when I, sell out the palace, you know, the arena where the Pistons played, or like, we just, I just would see it for some reason. But that's the best part about believing and having faith is you don't have to worry so much about the how, you just have to put yourself in the best situation possible and put your best foot forward. I was just putting myself out there any way I could when it came to music, even if it made me uncomfortable, even if I didn't want to do it, I just treated it like it was a full-time job since I was like 11, 12 years old. Do I ever doubt myself? Yes, I do doubt myself sometimes. And the universe always reminds me that I'm supported. When I have anxiety about something coming up, I realize it's just because that's a moment that's in front of me and I'm not in that moment yet. That's my biggest thing when I doubt myself is I try, I sometimes get too ahead of myself. Oh, what's this gonna be like? What is it gonna turn out like? Oh, I hope this is successful. Oh, I hope my album goes number one and all these things, but I've been at my grandma's house, at my mom's house in the basement in the room with no money, slept on floors. I've been, did all these things, and I was totally fine. You know, if I ever had to go back to that, I, not only could I survive, I could probably do it all over again. You know, being an artist takes putting yourself out there and, you know, generally comes with some insecurity. In that early phase of one's career, though, you have to deal with a lot of no's. Where did you find the fortitude to just keep, you know, pounding the pavement, selling the CDs, you know, in the face of not always uh, an enthusiastic audience? Like, just the people I surrounded myself with were sometimes angels in disguise, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's too ridiculous, bro. Like, I have, like, the the rap fairy tale story that's like one in a trillion, you know? Who gets to rap for one of their favorite rappers at the time that they wrote down that they wanted to be signed to? You know what I mean? Like the story is just like too unbelievable. You know, faith is like that invisible bridge. It's like you can't even see it, but you know it's there and you walk and you just know you're not gonna fall. But. There was one time where I lost faith completely and was done. When was this? This was when I was 18 and 19 years old. It's the first time I ever dealt with like depression. And it was, I rapped for Ye when I was 16. And we were in contact, him and his team, like Don C, you know what I'm saying? Shout out Don C, shout out John Monopoly. It was a lot of people like hating on me too. But it was like... Within the crew? Within the crew, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, I get it. You know what I'm saying? Um, that's a whole nother story, but I, I truly got love for all of them guys. Anyway, after I rapped for him and the contact was there, he called my mom and was like, yo, I want to sign your son. I think he has the potential to be like a, a figure in rap and be the next one out of Detroit and one of my protégés, you know? And I'm like, oh, this is it. Like, I'm going to do it, you know? And... Time goes by, all my friends go to school and shit, right? And I'm at home, still in the same room I've been in since I was eight years old, sleeping in the same bed. 
all my friends in school, like, yo, man, what's up? Like, what you been on, bro? Like, I'm, let's, like what's up with the record deal? Like, what's going on with this? I, didn't, I had no answer. My grandmother, she was like the strongest person ever, bro. Like, I always, I always bring her up. She was like in World War II. She was a female black captain. She like was one of the first police officers. Every Sunday I would come for Sunday dinner, my grandma would be like, yo, what's going on with the music thing? Have you heard? Like, yo, maybe you should enroll back in school. Like, and I was believing it. But it was like, I had to put in perspective that yay, and then we're blow they were blowing up too. You know, I, I had to, I didn't keep that in perspective then though. So I'm just thinking that they not with me and I gave up all my school opportunities and I'm just like super depressed. How important is it to take risks? I mean, what's life without risk? You know, if you take none, that's probably what you're gonna get. That's like an old bar. To me, taking risk is just exploring different parts of yourself that, you know, you may have never even thought was possible. They're pushing yourself to a limit that unlocks a whole nother um, aspect of who you are. Take a risk. It's like, I don't know what's gonna happen. At least I don't have to look back on my life wishing I woulda, coulda, shoulda went to that radio station and rap for yay, or I shoulda took that job across the world. Like whatever it is in your life, it's like, just try it. You know, people be hating on you for trying shit. And it's like, the beginning part of doing something is you have to try it first. In that time, were you aware that you were depressed? or is that something that you've sort of observed in hindsight? I was aware I was depressed because it would bring me to tears and it would bring me to feeling like that I just was like paralyzed. But then when I went within, I found a lot of the answers that I was searching for. It's like, after I wrote it down, what a, how I want my journey to go, it's like, man, how can I support this? What's the smallest thing I could do? I could go back down to the radio station and rap, I could ask. Yo, how you do this? I could just be curious, you know what I mean? I could go to open mics, I could um, do all these things. That's when I started changing my mindset, doing the work and realizing that I could choose to be happy no matter where I'm at. When I did that and I met these other producers, I started this, I started talking to John Monopoly more, I just started manifesting it, bro, and then they sent the record deal in. But for those two years, it was very hard. And I just remember b being broken down to tears, just like, man, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And I enrolled in community college and I went to the community college and I was gonna start class that next week. And my mom, she was just like, man, what are you doing? What's going on? Like, you could do this. Like, just keep going, just keep going. And I remember I shortly got the contract from Good Music after that. And it was for $15,000. And I remember it was signed by Donda West. It was just like the first money I ever really, really made off music. I could have sold my publishing for an extra 50,000 and I opted not to. Probably very, very smart. It was very smart, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's million, worth millions now. So I'm actually holding back a lot of emotions because it was definitely quite a time where it could have went either way. You know what I'm saying? It could have went either way. So I'm just super thankful that I, I had my mom there for sure. With a contract in his hand and his publishing secure, Big Sean joined Good Music as the group was reaching its peak. His songwriting credits and his star turn multiplied, but so too did his professional and personal troubles, leaving Sean in an increasingly dark place. This is sort of the dawn of the blog era. Right. And there was this feeling, and we watched, I'm sure you watched it, I've watched many artists that they get signed to a major, mm -hmm. and then they think, oh, the label's gonna take care of it from now on. Yeah. And then they stall out, and six months go by, and then they're and on the and shelf, it's, and... Then it's over. They, yeah, you never hear from them again. Yeah. And that moment is one that I think trips up a lot of artists, particularly in that era. How long into, after signing that paperwork, did you realize, oh, I have to make myself a priority? Like, I would come out and work with Ye and like work, you know, with the rest of good music and sh on his stuff. I was thinking selfishly then and being like, man, when are we gonna work on my stuff type of vibe, you know? 
And that wasn't the point of it. The point of it was you're getting a masterclass on how the inner workings of actually making something special works. The process was priceless. It was unbelievable. It taught me a lot, but then I realized I had to be proactive. You know, I realized that I can't wait around and I just need to use this cosign for what it's worth and not depend on anyone, you know, just try my best. You know, I couldn't make an album as good as Ye or Jay or all these people, but it's like, I could do my best. I could take what I learned and do my best, right? And I would start putting out projects. And every time I put a mixtape out, I saw my numbers grow a little bit more, a little bit more, right? The first one to the second one. And then the third one was Finally Famous Volume 3 that I put out. And that was the first mixtape I did where it like crashed that piff, right? And it was like, like the, I did a freestyle called Super Duper Lemonade. I remember that. Yeah, and it was like, that was the first time I went viral. I remember I was getting like $500 a show and then it went up to like 2,000, 2,500. And I'm like, now I'm starting to actually make something. So then we did the BET Cypher. That was the first time I saw my followers increase like 100,000 followers immediately. I was like, this is like a moment for me. And like, I feel like it was a slow grind until that point. And like, I feel like my label was finna drop me. You know what I'm saying? Cause I had also signed a Def Jam at that point. But for the last year or so, Def Jam was just like, well, he's kind of just more like a mixtape artist. And it was when No ID was also the head of good music. And he was like, man, you got it. We got to figure out how to make you like not a mixtape artist. I listened to No ID and was very uncomfortable because I made the song My Last with Chris Brown and I personally, it wasn't my favorite, you know what I'm saying? I was used to like not doing that type of music for real. And I remember being in LA, working on my album out here and DJ Felly Fell playing it on the new at two. And it was the first time I heard my song on the radio for real. And I remember like I was crying, I'm like, oh shit. He's like, man, it's the new it too. This is my dog, Big Sean, man. I love this record. It's my favorite record out right now. And I just remember being like, what the f is going on? You know, when I was younger, I used to think success was like hearing my song on the radio and like being able to move my mom out of the neighborhood we grew up in on the west side of Detroit. I think that's a part of success, but I really realized it's not necessarily the action, it's more so the feeling. I would say it's almost synonymous with happiness. Um, I don't consider having the most money in the world to be successful. I think that's a part of success, but I don't think that it's successful. You know, you could be successful spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, and it, it all kind of like boils down to just that feeling of love and happiness. In that time, you're a young guy who is coming from a world where you are surrounded by real friends, like friends from home. Kind right, of right, right. People that know you, people that you look out for, that look out for you. Uh -huh. Now you're in the industry uh -huh. and there's a transactional sort of layer to those relationships. You know, how did you emotionally navigate and figure out how to work those, you know, networking and providing value to people, but also not letting yourself be too exposed? Mm, wow, that's a good question. You know, you have to pick and choose who you give yourself to in all aspects, right? This industry is full of people who are high as all the time. People who are on drugs, people who are easy to be an alcoholic, a functioning alcoholic. Every dressing room you go to, every club you go to, is bottles everywhere, right? You're dealing with people who are really going through a lot of like substance abuse, you know what I'm saying? So like, sometimes I've experienced where people would trip on me and I'd be like, what the, like, or they'll be paranoid or they'll like make a story up in their head. You know, I remember Ye thinking that I picked Drake over him for some reason, when we made the song Blessings. And I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? You know, Ye heard it. And Ye had been a real instrumental part of my third album, Dark Sky Paradise. He had like, he was featured on there like three times or something like that. Blessings was the last song that I got added at the very last second. And he heard it and he was like, I gotta be on the song. And I was like, oh, bro, like, <laughs> it's like too 
late. It's like I'm turning my, my pre-order comes out in like a day. You know, this was it was different than how it is now. But yeah, yeah, at the yeah. same time, I helped him get the verse done. I wrote the verse with him. Right. So it's like, all right, you put me on, bro. So I'm going to listen to whatever the f you say. Like, if you want to be on it, let's figure it out and we'll figure out the logistics later. Before I left the studio, I'm talking to his engineer. Yo, make sure y'all deliver his verse to the master and plan. Da da da. Make this happen. Like, make sure Ye is on this. I wake up the next day, I called, can't remember, his engineer. I'm like, yo, did y'all send it? Oh, what? Oh, like, I'm like, did y'all send the verse, man? I'm trying to turn my in right now. Like, I'm not an AR. I shouldn't even be dealing with this. I told you guys to send it, but I'm such a like pushover at that time in my life. And I just was like trying to do everything. You know, I'm doing this. I'm calling the master plan. It's just like, I had no business even doing all of that. So anyway, it didn't get delivered on time. They turned the album in. Ye wasn't on the album version. I'm like, oh man, he got to be on it, you know? And then I'm getting calls from the label being like, well, you got like a super high amount of pre-orders. If you add this version to it now, you're going to lose all this. And I remember hitting Ye and being like, yo, bro. You know, he was like, oh, don't even trip. Like, we'll just do the edit, the radio edit, you know? So I'm thinking everything's cool, bro. And then I realized that it's not. So it's just like, when I say these things, that's just an example of like a lot of situations where it's like, how, how could I have even done anything different? Not do the song, not take the song. Like, I help you write the verse. I f am on call anytime you need me to, you know, it's just, it gets frustrating um, in hindsight. But, you know, now in this stage of my life, I've been sober for, you know, quite a little time. And it's like, I be raw dogging all my emotions. It's like, I be facing them head on. Back then I wasn't, I was like, would smoke weed all the time. I was like drinking all the time, but that was how I was able to cope with it, but it was a lot of just pressure and stress. Yeah, so this is like how I do it, you know? No sound booth for you? No sound booth. This is like, you know, Celine Dion records on this okay. This is like the Rolls Royce of microphones. Sometimes I get in here myself and like record on the reference mic, like just set up a session and just vibe out here. So you no engineer, just you? Sometimes, like when, I was, when it's time to cut for real, I have my engineer. I just know how to like cut enough, good enough for like a reference, you know? Okay, so you get a little demo to like feel it. Yeah. Clearly vibe and impulse is very important to you. Mm -hmm. And is having that sort of 24 seven access to be able to get your ideas out really crucial? It is crucial, it is, because the music is 24-7, inspiration is 24-7, you know? It's like, there have been times where I had to like wake up and record a reference immediately, and there have been times where I didn't step inside the studio for a week because it just wasn't there. Yeah. You know, you kinda gotta like listen to that voice. The last time I wrote on paper, like, lyrics i write a lot of ideas down but the last time i wrote paper on lyrics was when i was working with yay on graduation really yeah you know the reason i like it is because when i get like in that state of consciousness and i get on the mic mm -hmm. it's like sometimes you find a certain rhyme scheme that you would have not able to not have been able to write down per se you know what i'm saying so to me, it's like a very intimate relationship with that stream of consciousness and like getting it out because you know, you're creating something out of nothing. It's like real powerful at that point when you do it like that. You talked about kind of stumbling your way through putting that first record together and figuring out on the fly mm -hmm. what a Big Sean album sounds like, right? Right. And I know you've talked before about feeling in retrospect maybe a little disappointed in the second record and qualitatively. You know, what was your process as you got through those those first two albums and then, of course, got to the third one where you really took the time to sort of dig deeper and sort of get into it a little bit more? Yeah, it was just not listening to everyone being like, yo, hurry up. Like, I was, everyone, like, after I did my first album, I was like, you got to do a mixtape and an album. You know, I remember the same week I put Detroit, the mixtape out, Click came out with me, Jay-Z and Kanye. Mercy had already been going. Then I put in the Detroit mixtape out. Then they're like, oh, but we need the album. I was just too spread thin, um, just trying to figure out like, oh, this is album, this is mixtape, this is that. Oh, this is Cruel Summer, this is that. Like, even with the Cruel Summer records, like Mercy and Click, like that was, those could have been just my songs because it was like, I came up with, the stickiness of those songs, the 
Um, not necessarily mercy, because that's really more in the beat. But like, just the swerve and the, for click, I did the, you know, just did it real quick, just ideas, because I was in a, it was, I was in a mode at that point. And I think I didn't put the attention necessary on the album. I kind of just was like, yeah, 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 just, okay, cool, it's fine, just rush it out. How can you tell a good idea from a bad idea? Well, one of the things I've learned later on in my life is there's really no such thing as good and bad. It's kind of all perspective. It all is kind of like unique to the actual person, right? Because it's all about paying attention to how you feel. You know, does it move you? Is it fun? Is it inspiring? Or is it something that you're gonna regret later on? Time is like the currency of the universe and it's way too expensive to be spending on things that are weighing you down. It's one thing to, to, to write when you're in your bedroom and there's no time pressure and you're just, you're there to create. Uh -huh. It's another thing to create some momentum and be on the road, partying, out, promoting, doing work and also being a, a rapper. Yeah. And then also having to sit down and there's intellectual and creative labor that goes into writing a verse. Yeah, and being under pressure. Yes. And like wondering, like, how am I gonna stand out? And one of the things that I didn't keep in perspective is how much I was losing myself in those moments because I was disregarding the personal relationship with myself and replacing it with just like trying to get things done. And, you know, I was losing the aspect of like Sean Anderson, of like who I was, you know, like the, the son, the grandson, the anime head, the video game lover, the con like I was just, I was just literally losing all of that. Beyonce will talk about the Sasha Fierce persona and I think mm -hmm. there is that dichotomy. How did you sort of navigate that as you realized that there was this growing rift between the you that you present to the world and the you that you has to live every day and also mm -hmm. is the sort of creative engine that all of this greatness comes from. Exactly, wow, that's a great point. It was too late for me when I realized that. So I did the second album, the mixtape, the Cruel Summer, you know, the All Me, the whole Shut the f Up verse, all these like things. And then I was dug deep into do Dark Sky Paradise, and then I was like, did 2088 with Janae, and then like, I was like, that's when I started doing the Adderall, because I needed something to keep me going. I was just wiped out. And if you look at pictures of me back then, I was like 120 pounds, bro. I was like, I looked like I was on f crack. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wouldn't even be f eating sometimes. How did the Adderall affect your writing and your performance? It was, it was still me. It wasn't like the drug, it wasn't like the Adderall talking. It was the still me. It just activated, like, it gave me the energy I needed. But I realized that that comes at a cost, you know? And the cost is how all of this shit affects your brain. It hit me hard when I turned 30. You know, that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, I didn't even know and recognize who I was anymore. I didn't even know what I liked anymore. I'm like, shit, I'm over here trying to just rap. I don't even know what the f I'm into no more. I had to like reconnect with myself. I felt like I was gonna self-destruct, not just career-wise, like, I mean life-wise. Like, I felt like I was gonna like end it. I had to either like climb that wall or let it fall on me. Despite establishing himself as a star, Big Sean ended the 20 teens looking for meaning outside of music. After embarking on a series of changes to his personal life, he found new peace as an artist and new motivation for his work. You talked about having writer's block after Dark Side Paradise. And I'm curious, what was the process of sort of reacclimating yourself to writing, you know, from a sober place? Um, Especially when, you know, you're known for making records that live in the club. Right, right. I think it was just like not having writer's block was just, I had to stop writing. I just had to like stop. I just had to do other things and then get inspired. 
and realize that it's bigger than that, you know? And I got songs that's gonna live in the club forever. You know what I'm saying? And that, that ain't based on talking about drinking or whatever, or smoking or whatever, it's just the actual songs, yeah. you know? So I just had to step away. The, the, the best cure for writer's block for me has been to not write. It's to reverse the words, you know? It's like writer's block, block the writing and do something else, you know what I mean? Did you ever have moments of anxiety that it might be gone? Did I have moments of anxiety that I'm, yeah, of course, of course, but as weird as it sounds, bro, I made an agreement with God and the universe that like, I'm gonna always be good no matter what, whether that's financially, whether it's like, that's just one of the things that like, no matter what, I'm gonna always be good. I remember I met with Sad Guru and I was like, man, where's your favorite place? He was like, wherever I'm at, that's my favorite place. And it's just like, wherever I'm at, bro, that's where I'm, I'm gonna be best at. So I don't have that fear anymore, I used to, of like, what happens if you lose it all? What happens if that? And it's like, that's not a reality for me. I remember talking to you in the moments leading up to uh, Dark Side Paradise, and mm -hmm. you were so proud and, and you felt really accomplished. Like, mm -hmm. you had mastered making records that went on the radio in those first two albums, and this was your real step into the album format in a way that you felt like mm -hmm. this can stand next to the best records from Ye or J or you know, right. M or any of these people. Yeah, that's right. After you have achieved that, where did your mind go from there in terms of recalibrating goals and thinking about w what the rest of your career would look like? Um, I think that you can't, you can't see the full picture, the full scope of things, you know, on the road of life. You kind of got to get to a checkpoint. So for me, that was a checkpoint of saying, okay, I got here, now where do I want to go from here? It's not all about making music. It's not what life is about. It's not about like, how can you go number one again? Can you, I would love to go number one again. If I don't, I'll be fine too, you know? So it's like, you realize that it's more to that, man, because I had a conversation and it's like, bro, what if while we're in our bodies for this short amount of time, as, as far as, as fast as time goes, what if we're here just to, the main part of it is to advance our souls, man. And we sitting here worried about a job or like trying to make enough money, which is very important, but it's not the everything. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it shouldn't take the whole capacity of your life up, you know? And the, all, the, all the other accolades and things, those are great. And those are, you know, the, to inspire people, to lift them up, that's, that's the main, that is a, a goal and a purpose, but it's just not the whole thing to me. I went through a terrible writer's block. It was after my Dark Sky Paradise album. I was trying to come with another album immediately. I was on tour overseas. I couldn't find a, the right amount of sleep pattern to get on to be able to perform and record. And I started taking Adderall. Even though I was able to finish my album, I decided and really lock in and do it. It destroyed a lot of my body. You know, I was creating this false dopamine in my brain. I remember walking into the studio and feeling like, I can't even do this without being on Adderall. You know what I'm saying? And that's when I knew I had a problem. It was depression and it was like paralyzing. When I did quit cold turkey, I just like was like, man, I gotta focus on me. I was always had a, always had a spiritual side to me, but I decided to like connect with myself and really like, you know, reestablishing my consciousness and my flow and my relationship with God. And it really brought back the inspiration and just gave me a whole new outlook on life. So I'll never let myself get that deep into work because working and our work are two different things because your life's work may not necessarily be your work work all the time. It's all about perspective. You know, at the outset of your career, you, you lived through the blog era. You mastered the end of radio. <laughs> yeah. Then you got bounced back, which was a huge streaming success. Yeah. You know, the last four years, we have lived through a global pandemic that mm -hmm. have not only topsy-turvied the world, but really fundamentally changed culture and music. How has this period changed your thinking about the art that you make and how you communicate it to the audience? 
People always hate me. You need to do this more. You need to be on TikTok more. And I just be like, I'm down to be on TikTok. I actually like, I love TikTok. I love social media. Um, sometimes I be having to delete it though because it's like it's too distracting for me sometimes. I accept it for what it is. I don't know where I fit in per se in it. I just know that I'm gonna just do me. I don't know if I'll be the biggest streaming artist or not or whatever, but I'm gonna just figure out how to put my message into these new vessels of getting it out to people. And it's not really based on how well it does or the success of it is based on if I feel it or not. Being an artist takes a certain amount of selfishness yeah. because you have to look inward in a very pointed way and you have to abide by your own impulses and your own vibe. Being a parent is the opposite. It takes nothing but selflessness. Right. How do you huh. navigate that as the father of about to be two year old? It's like a balancing act that I'm like still trying to figure out because he's ever changing and I'm ever changing. And he's the best thing that's ever happened. But yeah, I always want to be there. Um, there's a song on my album I wrote about him and I'm like, I pray I'm there for every memory you want me on. You know, the crazy thing about being a dad, for me, it's like, it's the soft spot. It's like tender. It's like, I've never felt anything like that. I always feel like I can make it through anything in life. I could do without anything. I can't do without him, you know? Yeah, but as far as like finding that balance, it's a constant struggle because all I kind of want to do sometimes is just be with him. But it's like, I have to, I also want to fulfill my purpose that I have in getting, being my voice heard, writing a book. You know what I'm saying? I wrote this book. This was like a product of Noah inspiring me to get it done and realize that things don't last forever. That's one of the things that Noah has taught me, my son. I know your name is Noah too. <laughs> but like, you know, it's to like be present in the moment and know that the power of now is real and we got to do it right now, so. With your new record, you know, if you could sort of close your eyes and imagine a feeling that you hope to leave your listener with, like what, what is that? The feeling I hope to leave my listener with is the feeling that is uh, the missing ingredient of whatever their life was missing to make them the ultimate uh, version, their, their highest self. It's a multifaceted album, you know. I have these four graphs that represent four different things. So I got turned up songs. I got songs that are more focused. I got songs that are a, a conscious moment of clarity. Then I got songs that where I live in happiness, like with the one about my son and all these things. So I think that there is something for people who are going through all different aspects where the record can uh, put them in the mode they need to be in and be a soundtrack to whatever, whatever they got going. So, you know, that's the whole point of the album. And I kind of struggle with trying to make the album all one thing, but I'm a multifaceted person. So I just made a multifaceted album that is all different parts of me. I spend a lot of time here, you know. Um, as you can see, I got like all my designs. These are like not the official album stuff, but these are just like the rough drafts we had to go through, you know what I'm saying? It's like. This is actually close to the actual cover. Did you know specifically what you wanted the cover to look like or did you do the shoot and then it kind of came into focus? Yeah, so we did the shoot and like it kind of just came into focus. Like we had all different like ideas. To me, the color theory was like super important. Like the colors of the album that represent like pressure being red, focus being green, clarity being blue and like happiness being um, like gold, yellow. And each vinyl has like a extra song that relates to that. Like if it's the happiness vinyl, it's like an extra song that relates to happiness, an extra song that relates to pressure. So I was just trying to do something different for my community. Did this process come together before or after the music? This kind of helped finish the music because it's like you get to a certain point, but you can't really finish it until you see it. And I'm like more of a visual person, so I had to like really see it. I come from that like Virgil Abloh, you know, that school of Kanye type scrutiny of like not stopping until it's right. You know what I mean? 
I'm working on the music to like the very last second I can, you know, because it's like, it's constant ideas and things. And like I said, as a critic, as your worst critic, you'll never be all the way satisfied with your work. You know what I mean? You always be like, oh, I could have done better. I could have done that. You've mentioned that you have sort of transcended past caring what other people think. Mm -hmm. But I imagine not you... transcended. I care less though. Okay. I care less. Yeah, I, I do care. I do care about my. I'm sensitive about my. Shit. Like I, I care, but I do care. It doesn't destroy me anymore. You know, like it used to. Like, oh my God, D seven six zero said that I suck. You know, I'm like, oh. Shit. I used to like really be like a hundred positive comments. Be like, man, there go one negative comment. Like this. Shit, shit, you know, it's like weird. Last year, Andre 3000 came out and had that quote about not wanting to rap at 47 because what am I going to talk about? Go to the proctologist or whatever. Yeah, when he said that, I'm like, that's a good perspective. <laughs> like, you should rap about that. I, I'm curious, yeah. Do you feel like there is any sort of age limit on your expression through this medium? No, I do not feel like it's an age limit on it. It doesn't stop until you stop, you know what I'm saying? So for me, when I think about like, the other things I want to do though too, you know, like author or speaking and parent, I feel like I always have something to rap about as long as the journey is ever changing, as long as it doesn't get stale. Have I ever failed? As a person and an artist, you're hypercritical on yourself, even more critical than your worst haters. When I analyze those times of what may, some people may consider it a failure. I don't consider it a failure. I consider it exactly what was supposed to happen, period. So I have never failed. In fact, the times that I have regretted, if it would have changed any course of where I would be today, then I probably wouldn't have even chosen it. And it's always an opportunity, no matter where you're at, to get to where you know you deserve to be at, no matter what. You mentioned Ye, I have to ask, you know, obviously he said some very unkind things on Drink Champs, mm -hmm. and you responded to them, I thought, fairly coherently and, you know. Yeah, of course. With some empathy. I was drunk too, because we were on Drink Champs, okay. so I was like drunk. <laughs> but I, I've seen pictures of you guys. And After. Afterwards. Uh -huh. How did you reconcile within yourself to be able to move past that? Oh, because I don't take what he says personally at all. I mean, you're talking about a guy who has said like, I don't even want to say some of the stuff he said because I'm not about to blast him, even though I'm sure he would blast the shit out of me, but I, I just don't take it personal because he said what he said and then we were in the studio right after, you know? And that's when I kind of looked at him differently though, because, you know, when it's like, oh man, people gonna say this when we get back. When we get back cool, or, you know, I'm just like, oh, we gotta make sure we get a picture. I'm just like, bro, you said some foul ass Like, I got a whole city that rock with me. You know, at first, when he first said it, I'm like, bro, I gave you 185 million records under good music. I'm the only profitable artist ever that's ever signed to you. You also talked about in that incident, you know, having pretty messed up business as a result of the Def Jam deal and, and the good music mm -hmm. deal. Yeah, that was the weirdest thing too, because it was like, if I'm old M's, like say you sign a deal where it's like, it's not the best deal, right? But you do so well in the deal that you're owed a certain amount of money and they still don't pay you that. It's like, yeah, I started talking about this because there was no other movement going on, you know? But bro, I've gotten taken advantage of for being a nice guy for real, bro. Like I could really have these people burnt the out out here. Like the that I've been through and seen, like I, I'm, I'm a solid guy though. So it's like, I'm not even going to do that. Did you get that resolved? Yeah, it got resolved. I took, I, I'm going to keep it 1000. I settled. I probably could have. So you got some. Yeah, I didn't want to go to court for real and do all that and like sue and stuff. It was just like, I just learned my lesson. What advice would you give to a young artist, you know, that is navigating similar waters? First of all, by the way, I don't regret the opportunity. The choice was either to do that or nothing. I'm doing that every time. Like the, the opportunity to sign to an artist of that magnitude, that's that smart and all these different things is a golden opportunity. So I'm never on that. 
I don't ever want people to get that confused. Like, like I'm on that. That's not what I'm on. I'm on the fact of like withholding someone's money. You know, it's like you doing a job and somebody being like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I'm rich as, but I'm gonna just like chill out on paying you. It's like the. But my advice is to just do the best business you can, be solid, speak up, and get your paper. And when you're in that vibration, bro, things just come to you. Like, God gonna support you, bro. The universe gonna support you and line it up for you in ways that you didn't even think was possible. And you have to, we have to drop our expectations and our ideas of what we think success is and realize that success is a feeling. It's happiness, bro. It's love. It's holding your kids. It's being with the people you love. It's sharing these experiences. That's what it's really about.